Hello, everybody. This is a Candidates Discuss Extra coming at you from Athens for Everyone. And we're lucky enough to have with us today uh, Richard Dean Winfield, Devin Pandy, and Jesse Hool, who will be discussing the topic of election reform. And uh, maybe, maybe, maybe if we have time, if the inclination strikes us, we might talk about some other things. Um, but election reform is where we want to, to focus today. So uh, first off, let's have you guys introduce yourselves. Devin, can we start with you? Absolutely. Hello, everyone. My name is Devin Pandy. I am the Democratic nominee uh, to represent Georgia's 9th Congressional District. Uh, is there anything else you'd like me to say by myself? I think that's enough, right? Yeah, well, I think those are very important things. If there's anything, you know, key you want to hit, go for it. But if you feel good. I'm good. Yeah, that was nice. Solid. Thank you. Awesome. Um, <laughs> Jesse, you want to go? Sure, I'll keep it short and sweet too. My name is Jesse Hool, and I am simultaneously and strangely the commissioner-elect and candidate for commission of District 6 in Athens. All right, and that leads us to Richard. My name is Richard Dean Winfield. I am one of eight Democrats running amongst 21 candidates in the jungle election for the U.S. Senate. Uh, I did run in the 10th district two years ago um, as a Democrat who was supporting a federal job guarantee. Uh, so I've had experience seeing how elections work both in, at the district level and the statewide level. And I think there's a, a lot to be improved and we, I look forward to discussing the situation. Awesome, yeah. And on that note, election reform, anyone wanna start us off on their, their big thoughts? I would, um, since I'm probably the least knowledgeable here, I'll probably simply be bringing my ideas to the table. So I'll tell you one thing that has really affected, affected my my race and that is the fact that i am not independently wealthy and so literally every single dollar that has come from this campaign or that has come to this campaign has been from small dollar donors i also have pledged not to accept uh, contributions from corporate PACs so i don't have any money coming from there either and so uh, i feel that i know that the people of this district are behind me because they are literally fueling my campaign. Now, what I, what I have issue with is the fact that, um, and we see this on both sides of the aisle, but uh, what I have issue with is that my opponent is independently wealthy. He's worth $10 million. And so, you know, dropping $750,000 on his own campaign is a drop in the bucket for him. And so how do we ensure that the people who are essentially hiring someone to represent them are doing so because uh, they have all of the information that they need about the two candidates or is it because one candidate had had more of a means to get their message out to the people and so uh, i definitely would like to explore how we can make uh elections a little more fair not only for the candidates but for the constituents as well Yeah, I'm, I find myself in a similar posi position to you, Devin, where uh, certainly by no means am I independently wealthy at all. And uh, the, the current opponent I have is a fairly wealthy individual, owns a lot of property and things. And before that, I was running against an incumbent who was not a super wealthy person, but was more, you know, well connected. And it's interesting how the structures we have in place in our society kind of at every level really continue to favor the people who are already 
favored in their economic well-being, you know, which tends to go hand in hand with their social capital. Um, so I think, you know, publicly funding elections is um, one really big way that we could we could help in that regard. Um, I think it's more of a, a federal level issue for y'all. On the local level, I think a lot about um, voter enfranchisement. And, you know, one of the things I'm curious y'all's thoughts on is what role can we as local governments play at trying to enfranchise more people in at least local level elections, um, you know, while we're waiting for the state and federal government to catch up in that regard. You know, so there's a, there's a lot of folks who can't vote for a variety of reasons. They might be on parole, they might be undocumented, um, not to mention age and, and uh, things like that. And so how can we, you know, get more people um, more easily registered, uh, lower some of those barriers around ID requirements and things like that. Um, and, uh, and I think the other thing that sort of exists in my mind just generally underlying all of this is we have this concept of a representative democracy is theoretically rooted in the idea that the people are going to pick folks mm -hmm. to represent them. And we tend to trust that electoral results are wills of the people. And I think we tend to downplay how low turnout is in so many elections, especially local elections. You know, the spring election we had. Um, for commission uh, here on the local level, there was maybe a fifth of the people who live in the district actually voting in that election. You know? So when we talk about like who's really being represented, um, there's both, there's kind of these parallel questions of who's really able to run and then also, you know, who's voting for those people when they can run and uh, trying to answer those in tandem, I think is really important. I think Jesse brought up uh, two important aspects of the problem. One is the obstacles to having people be able to vote and have their vote count. Um, these have to do with obstacles to registration, disenfranchisement of people who are in prison or had been in prison, disenfranchisement of people in our colonies and in the District of Columbia, um, for example. And then of course, there are the problems of gerrymandering, partisan gerrymandering, which is another way in which votes are not allowed to count um, and then there's the other problem in terms of the obstacles people have to be able to run for office. And that reflects the, the, the way in which money, alas, conditions, not only one's ability to run for office, but also to have access to the voters. And uh, one thing in general that uh, one has to keep in mind is that even if you get beyond all the obstacles to voter suppression, if you are unable to find out about who you're voting for and what they stand for, your right to vote is pretty empty. And from my experience, both running in a deep red district as a Democrat two years ago in the 10th district and in this current race, it's pretty clear that the voters have not been informed about the candidates. Now, part of that is because your ability to inform the voters depends from the point of view of candidates from having money to pay for access to the voters. Because in our system, you need money to gain access to the voters. And that's exacerbated under a pandemic when in-person events are extremely restricted and suspended. That makes it all the more problematic. So on the one hand, you have the way in which money is allowed to infect the entire political process. The other side of it is that what could potentially loosen the grip of money on the electoral process is the, the activity that a free press could engage in. That is, a free press has, a, has a, a duty, I think a democratic duty, to inform the public about who the candidates are and what they stand for. But that is not happening. Our press does not do that. Our press, for example, has completely <laughs> neglected all the candidates, myself included, except for the for establishment candidates in the special election I'm in. And they don't report on the issues even when they do deal with those top four candidates. But they leave people without any knowledge of who they're voting for. And uh, in districts that are deep red, such as the 10th and even more in the 9th district, a Democrat who is not independently wealthy is not going to be able to obtain enough money to be able to get who they are and what they stand for out to a majority of the voters. And we have to keep in mind 
that there is a, a media vacuum in many of these areas that are outside the metro areas. The print media is disappearing. There is not broadband for all. Many people don't have the money, even if there is broadband, to subscribe to it. So they just don't have an opportunity to find out about uh, who's running. And when you take up the issue of, of the difficulties to run for office, uh, you have to think about the fact that about 95% of people in America, uh, at least who are breadwinners, are employees. I'm an employee, a state employee. I'm required by law to go on unpaid leave for the duration of, of a campaign for statewide or federal office, which means I have no income. Secondly, I, I don't get any benefits shipped into by my employer. And if I were an employee like most others, I would not have a job awaiting for me at the end of the campaign. I'm a tenured professor, so I can't get my job back. But for most people who are employees, it's really not feasible to run for office. And if you look at who is in office in our Congress, in the House of Representatives and the Senate, they're all on average millionaires. They're independently wealthy or they're professionals who can make money while they're running and go back to it. Um, and Basically, 95% of the people are not able to exercise their right to run for office. Now, that leaves open this whole big, vast area of how money infects our political process, which we need to discuss and what kind of remedies there could be. Um, regarding running for office, I think everyone who runs for office should be guaranteed replacement income during the duration of, of the race. And they should be guaranteed to get their job back if they lose. And they should have benefits. I mean, frankly, all benefits should be separate from employment including healthcare, thanks to Medicare for all, or pensions, thanks to a decent replacement income with decent benefits. But we can get into all these issues. I think we all know about them. So I'll pass the baton on <laughs> before saying anything else. Anybody else wanna chime in? What you feel like, I mean, we've, we've talked about money, we've talked about uh, the access, both for the voters and for people running. Um, what about the actual laws that exist? Um, I, I feel like I was, I've, I've learned a lot more this particular election about election laws. Um, but yeah, Jesse, you, have, you probably have some stuff to say about that. I have, I have a, maybe a few thoughts. Um, so, uh, one, there's this book that I picked up kind of randomly, uh, maybe a year or two ago that I really dug called How Democratic is the American Constitution? by this person, Robert Dahl, D-A-H-L. Um, and it talks about, among other things, how the majority of constitutional amendments that we've seen are actually about enfranchising more people, extending the right to vote to more people. So one of the things I think is really fascinating about the way we think of electoral politics in this country or democracy in America being kind of this bastion of that uh, is that the constitution is sort of our guiding light for everything. But one of the things that's deeply flawed about it is that it's written by people who are, you know, specifically trying to restrict most people from being able to vote, including regarding lots of people, not as people at all, you know, indigenous folks, enslaved people, et cetera. And so, um, so this idea of like being an imperfect democracy and trying to render it more perfect, I think we need to think really deeply about how fundamentally flawed some of how it's been built is. Um, and, and, and think deeply about how we can extend those rights more meaningfully. And then, you know, Richard kind of touched upon this, but it's not just about the right to vote, but also the ability to vote. I think a lot about people who are uh, advocates for abortion access and that, you know, it's not just whether it's legal in the state that you're in, but can you actually get to the clinic, you know, or afford to pay for one and things like that. Um, and so similarly, we're thinking about like giving people the ability to vote, you know, things like making voting days uh, national holidays, um, requiring that employers are, allow their employees to leave to vote while they're working, especially, you know, for folks who are part-time and things, because a lot of times those laws only end up applying to full-timers or salaried employees when they are passed. Um, and also, you know, right now we're required to vote at our precinct. And as maps get more and more gerrymandered, as populations change and, and layers of things overlap, the numbers can be really confusing. People get confused about where they can they can vote. Things are getting extra tricky in pandemic times. You know, we're seeing this stretched even further because not all of the locations we used to use can now work um, with health concerns in mind. And so just allowing people to vote more flexibly, you know, wherever in the county or maybe ideally in the state 
um, without having to cast provisional ballots, which is essentially like not having the vote counted, are uh, some things I think we could do real short term. I also want to point out that we have made some progress in Georgia in terms of enabling people to register and update their registration online. That's new, um, as well as giving people the ability to register to vote when they sign up for their license. Um, but there's still, of course, lots of limits there around access to the internet, as well as, you know, only some people can get licenses but still live here. Um, and uh, yeah, I guess as far as laws, the only other thing I felt really compelled to uh, bring up, sorry, I'm kind of going on a bit long here, is uh, when it comes to third parties, you know, we talk a lot about the, the stranglehold that the two major parties have on the federal level and all the way down to pretty much the local level in almost the entire country. Um, and a lot of that has to do with ballot access. There's a really, really high bar just to be able to get your name on the ballot if you're a third party candidate. And so, you know, lowering those restrictions, making the ballot more accessible um, for third party candidates, I think also could go along with that. Do you think that um, that uh, ranked choice voting could, uh, could help with that? Yes, I love ranked choice voting. So there's an organization I love called Fair Vote. Um, and that's one of the things that they really push for is ranked choice voting, sometimes also called instant runoff voting. Um, we're seeing it employed more and more by different institutions, like the Academy Awards use it and stuff. Um, and some localities have employed it, but yes, I would, I would absolutely love to see ranked choice voting. And it sounds like you're familiar with it, Devin. So since I've already taken up a lot of your time, you kind of want to share for folks who might not know what that is, kind of how that works. Actually, you kind of put me on the spot there. I mean, I, uh, I, uh, I, I, I understand it for myself, but I don't think I have enough of an understanding to be able to explain it to someone else. Okay, well, uh, sorry to put you on the spot. Uh, no worries. Kind of no the worries. short idea is, let's say, you know, in uh, Richard Winfield's race, for example, we all know that Richard is the long shot candidate in this 26 person race, right? But let's say I actually like Richard's platform the best. So I want to vote for Richard, but I don't want to feel like I'm losing the ability to vote for, say, Warnock, right, which is now kind of the front running Democratic candidate. Well, in ranked choice voting, everybody gets to rank however many people they want to vote for, whether it's one all the way to 26 or they just pick three. And then uh, the, the system that tabulates those votes would take whoever got the least amount of first place votes and remove their votes. And then anybody who voted for them as their first place choice and expressed a second place preference, then those second place votes would get added on. And you keep doing that until one person has over 50% of the whole vote. Uh, one of the things that I think is really wonderful about this, besides the obvious way that it enfranchises uh, candidates with further out platforms to actually, you know, we have a better sense of how many people really do support the Green Party or the DSA. How many people, you know, would love to vote for Winfield but don't want to feel like they have to choose between the two. Um, certainly in these presidential elections, we saw it happen with Ross Perot way back in the day or Ralph Nader more recently. Um, and so, uh, so it'd be really great for those scenarios, um, but it also enables, sorry, I sort of lost my train of thought. I, I just like completely- I mean, like, there, there are other varieties of that. The car went by and yeah. I lost my train of thought, but that's probably good enough, yeah. I mean, there are other varieties of, of, do, of doing something like that, which will allow a wider spectrum of candidates to be noticed. It involves, you simply vote for all the candidates who you would be willing to have hold the office and you avoid voting for those who you simply find unacceptable without ranking, and they just tally it up that, that way. Um, but you know, regarding the, yeah, yeah. You know, we don't have, I, well, actually, you know, to some degree, there is proportional representation in certain states with regard to how uh, electoral votes are distributed. Um, I think Maine has proportional voting in, in, in distributing people to the electoral college. Of course, the electoral college is, a, is a problematic in, it, in itself. One might even say the whole Senate is problematic. And I was in a kind of debate with someone who suggested one way of evading the fact that our constitution does not allow the Senate representation of, of two senators per state to ever be changed. It can't be amended. But he was saying, well, you know, we could have weighted voting inside the Senate, with, where, you know, if you're, if you're a senator from California, you know, your vote is simply gonna count maybe 30 times, you know, if you're a senator from Wyoming and, and, to, and to make it more representative. 
But you know, if you think about registration, it could really be automatic. I mean, you could, if you're born in this country, you can be registered. And when you turn 18 or whatever the limit turns out to be, you're ready to go. If you're naturalized, you're automatically registered at that point. And you know, we don't need anything else. Um, but I think also we need to think about providing everyone at least with a mail-in ballot. And when I say everyone, there is one problem that comes in when you try to deal with mail-in ballots and addresses, and that's homelessness. You know, the homeless are really hard to find. And there shouldn't be homeless people, first of all. And uh, we, should, we should eliminate that kind of problem. But we have to think about the representation of the homelessness, because there are a lot of homeless people in America, and a growing number of homeless people. And of course, there are a lot of problems getting access to, to voting people who are uh, disabled in various ways. And of course, who don't have act, who have different languages and so forth. All of these things have to be uh, dealt with properly. Um, but um, you know, one other thing regarding the right to vote, uh, I think Jesse brought up properly the, the idea that we don't want to have people who are permanent residents who don't have the right to vote. In other words, we want to make, first of all, people are here and they've been here a while. We obviously want to try to regularize their status but we also want to have as short a gap as possible between becoming a permanent resident and becoming a citizen. Because there, there are nations in the world, like in the, in the Gulf region, where they have all these permanent workers who do all, most of the work, but they're not allowed to become citizens. So they have no political freedom, in other words. So we really want to make the move from permanent residency to citizenship as quick as possible as a question, you know, of political freedom. And also, you know, unfortunately, the, uh, the whole movement in Georgia that Stacey Abrams is spearheading to try to ensure that voting uh, is not obstructed, they ignore the right to vote of prisoners. And there are many, many democratic nations which never take away the right to vote from anyone. And we're talking about two and a half million people in prison, about six and a half million people who have had their votes obstructed, their, their franchise obstructed because of that. And they're disproportionately poor people, disproportionately people of color. And if they had been allowed to vote, we would not have Donald Trump as president. We wouldn't have had Bush as president. We wouldn't have had Kemp as governor. We would have a completely different outcome. So I think we, we have to think about that as, as part of also getting things ready to have a more equitable uh, kind of um, um, gerrymandering, a nonpartisan gerrymandering, to make as many districts competitive in a way that you'll get something akin to proportional voting in terms of the outcome of representation in statewide elections and um, district elections. I think it's, it's important also to recognize that the it's no accident that people who are imprisoned or on parole or have somehow been taken out of that system can't vote. You know, that's really, we have to recognize that as the extension of slavery that this entire nation was built on. And it's a very deliberate decision to kind of extend that legacy to this day. Um, and, you know, similar to how you said um, that, you know, we need to really address the fact that so many people don't have housing who probably would like to and need it. <laughs> Uh, I think, you know, we also just need to get, we just need to like, I would say abolish prison, but we really need to like dramatically rethink our model for how we deal with folks who have somehow done something out of line with what we believe the social contract should be. Um, and in my mind, that would involve dramatically reducing our insanely high incarceration rate and, and not locking people in prisons in the first place. But one of the ways to sort of de-incentivize putting people in prison in addition to you know stopping using their labor for free things is uh to you know enfranchise them yeah and uh and i also uh wanted to share a thought on the the senate um you, know, you talked about the question of whether the senate is democratic i think that's you know thinking in terms of wyoming having as many votes as california or something uh, but also thinking back on that book uh the how democratic is the american constitution um the Senate wasn't even something you could vote on until you know about a hundred years ago. So um, the the majority of the time that this country has existed, the Senate wasn't even an elected position. Um, and so, like recognizing how recent it is, I think that just the idea 
that we should be choosing our officials is, um, as well as how recent it is to think of we as uh, including all people, you know, including women, including indigenous people, including black people, uh, has just not been a part of the majority of this country's history. Yes, um, so I have a couple of notes here on things that I wanna hit from what you've both said. So first, and these are just my, my, my personal opinions. And so with the auto registration um, to be able to vote at age 18, absolutely. Absolutely, I, I agree with that. Um, we have so many other things. I mean, you can automatically, you know, take your ID card and go buy a, um, a, a can of beer or a bottle of wine the day you turn 21. You know, things, things are automatic in this country based on certain criteria. In this case, we're talking about age. And so why wouldn't, you know, we say that voting is the, the, um, the crux of democracy. If it is, let's act like it. Um, another thing is uh, with prisoner voting. So yes, I'm glad you brought that up, Jesse. Because yes, if there is anything, we struggle sometimes to find concrete examples of what systemic racism is. Prisons, for the most part, are an example, a, a, a very concrete example of systemic racism. And being born when we are in the generation that we are, if we don't look back at history, we'll never understand why things came to be in the first place. And so we have to look at how prisons came to be, why they came to be. Um, why was that one clause put into the 13th Amendment so that uh, we could, um, or so that they could continue to imprison those that they were now um, not lawfully allowed to hold as slaves? We need to know those things. Not only do we need to know those things, but we need to, to preach those things. We need to teach those things to others so that they understand where these things came from. Uh, and also as far as prisoners voting, um, I, I understand that while you are imprisoned, I believe in, in um, punishments that fit the crime. And, uh, and I believe in, um, I, how do I say this? If we were to continue to say that prisoners who are convicted of a felony cannot vote, okay, fine. While they are, are serving their time, they are paying their dues to society. Once those dues are paid, they should uh, be allowed to regain all of the rights that they had before they were imprisoned, and that includes their right to vote. Um, but now we also have to think about, you know, the past, why people in prison aren't allowed to vote or weren't allowed to vote back then. And it's because they were targeting certain demographics that they didn't. Uh, so, uh, so why would you want that demographic that you know wouldn't vote for you to have the right to vote? And so in my personal opinion, um, if you are in jail, if you are in prison, you are still a citizen of this country. You should still have um, that right uh, to vote. It can be argued, and I could probably sw be swayed on that. But the part that I cannot be swayed on is regaining your rights, your full rights, once you have paid your dues to society. Um, also, uh, the one, one of the main things that we need to do in order to, to bring down the, pop, the prison population is to remove the incentive to imprison people, which means getting rid of for-profit prisons. Uh, that, that is probably, I've used this word already, but that is the crux of what makes um, throwing people in prison so valuable is that people are making people are becoming millionaires and billionaires off of the legal enslavement of human beings also uh, when it comes to when it comes to the senate weighted voting 
I like this. And I think that there would be no easier way to convince our compatriots on the other side of the aisle to, uh, to allow our DACA folks to get their citizenship, to, uh, to, um, uh, to move our, our permanent residents to citizenship quicker if they knew that those that their population numbers going up means that their vote is counted uh, heavier. So, uh, so I, I, I like to look at what motivates people. Okay, so the, the uh, the definition of leadership is the ability to accomplish a task, mission, or goal uh, by influencing or the ability to influence others to accomplish a task, mission, or goal by providing uh, direction, purpose, and motivation. And so with everything that we're doing, we need to look at what is the purpose? Why are we doing it? What is our motivation for doing it? And what direction do we need to go in in order to do it? And before we, we make a decision based on those criteria, we also have to think about the second and third orders of effect of that decision. And if we are not doing those things, all of those things, we are failing as leaders, failing. I just wanted to say something about this issue of, of the right, retaining the right to vote in, in prison because you know, when someone is in prison, we're basically restricting their ability to will against, against right, which is why they're being punished in the first place. Um, but we don't take away their property. We don't take away their spousal rights. We don't take away their parental rights. I mean, obviously they can't take care of children. So if there isn't any other person around to take care of children, fine, some custody arrangement has to be made. But it's not as if you lose your rights. In fact, we punish you because we recognize your right to be held accountable for what you're doing. And, uh, you know, if, if we didn't hold you responsible, you, you couldn't be tried. Uh, you'd be more like an animal or something like that. Uh, you know, we're not at war with you, in other words. You remain a member of, of the community of rights. Um, so I think that, that's crucial, I think, to keep in mind. And, you know, we should have all been, had the chance to be campaigning inside prisons and, and getting the message out. Mm -hmm. uh, but you know, we're all facing this, this situation where vast amounts of money are needed in order to get your existence and message out to the voters. And there's this unrestricted flow of money coming in from those who have it um, in terms of money that's not reported uh, with, and then super PACs and all of this. And then independently wealthy individuals like Clyde um, and Kelly Leffler. In, in my race. Um, no one should be allowed to use their own money in a political campaign. We shouldn't allow any super PACs. We shouldn't allow any of these big money um, centers to be able to enter the political sphere. We should have public funding of elections. And, we, and you know, there is a law, but it only applies to the presidential race. You know, you know, when you pay your income tax, you check a little box. Not too many people are doing it lately, but it turns out very few presidential candidates want to accept the government subsidy because when they do they have to put a limit on how much other money they're going to they're going to raise and they know that under current conditions it's too easy to raise more money if you're an establishment candidate mm -hmm. so almost none of the candidates are any more even accepting that government subsidy but i think we need to make it mandatory we have to ensure that okay there are sufficient resources for every candidate to get their message to the voter for the voters to be informed and that's it that's all we need. That's all candidates need. And I have and a question. Like that. Going back to the prisoners, my question is yeah. um, the, the pennies a day that they are paid as prisoners, is that taxed? Uh, let me stop you right there to say that in Georgia, they're paid zero. Georgia's one of three or four states that pays absolutely zero. Um, and that's one of the things that I'm very opposed to. And, uh, 
I, I don't know, you know, how taxation might work in other places when it comes to like contracting with private prisons and things. Um, but my guess is that it's not taxed um, because generally things that are done through state agreements, you know, you don't pay taxes, but I, I can't say for sure. I'm not super knowledgeable about that. But what I do know is that in Georgia, uh, no one who is in prison is paid for their labor. Um, so when we think about the legacy of slavery as, you know, being embodied in our prison system, and, you know, sometimes people in other states are being paid, you know, like $4 a day or something. Um, but in Georgia, they're paid $0 and 0 cents for any of their time. Um, and, you know, Clark County um, actually put in their budget a bit of money to pay people what would have amounted to, I think, $4 a day um, for the people who are uh, working in county departments, um, but are held in the state prison here in Athens, Clark County. And the Georgia Department of Corrections said that they absolutely won't pay anybody with that. They like blockaded it basically. So now we're trying to figure out like, well, what's the next step? And, and in my view, kind of where I'm at currently is that I think we need to opt out. You know, you, you mentioned earlier, Devin, the contracting of private prisons as like an example of how, you know, we're still using an incentive for imprisoning people. But it's not just private prisons. I mean, these publicly run prisons are contracting with local governments and they're making agreements where you as a local, you know, the state of Georgia essentially has an agreement with athens Clark County. And you can see this spelled out in the budget where athens Clark County makes X amount of money uh, in the labor of the people held in that prison. And that makes up for the cost of running the facility. And so essentially we have a couple hundred people held in the state prison in athens Clark County who are paid zero to do work for the public in most of the depart most of the departments in Clark County have uh, inmate labor used somewhere therein. Um, in some cases, it's just one or two people, and in some cases, it's dozens. Uh, and of course, all around the state, we see that uh, being used for you know highway maintenance and things like that. And and that's just the completely obvious modern example of how the roads and railroads and things were built in the first place. You know, mm -hmm. um, so in my view we need to find a way to effectively uh, begin to blockade that being able to happen in the future. And my personal view on what needs to happen in Clark County is that we need to stop participating. Um, but I, you know, I've, I've had some really interesting conversations, including as recently as two weeks ago with Mayor Gertz on another Zoom talking about just this issue. And it sort of raises this complicated question of while people are in prison, you know, if athens Clark County closes our facility and they go somewhere else where they're treated even worse, is that better or worse? Um, on a systems level, I think it's maybe better to try to pressure the systems to not have a place to use that labor and sort of de-incentivize it overall. But on an individual basis, you know, those actual people are going to be worse off. And so that's a really complicated question that I'm very excited to talk about more, although I know it kind of gets way off track of our, uh, our main topic today of election reform. But I, I do think it's important to think critically about how thoroughly disenfranchised people are and the prison system being kind of the most egregious way that happens. It's one other important aspect of the disenfranchisement that I think people ignore. And that's that, uh, you know, in America, uh, you serve on a jury if you're on the voting rolls. But if you're disenfranchised, you're not going to be tapped for jury duty, which means that disproportionate number of poor people and people of color are not only, not only being deprived of the right to vote, but at the same time, they're deprived of sitting on juries, which slants them obviously in a certain direction. And um, that's problematic. Um, regarding paying of taxes by, by inmates, I think by and large, they make too little money to be taxed. I don't think they're anywhere paid a minimum wage. If they're going to do work, obviously it should be voluntary and they should be paid at least a minimum wage and not the current minimum wage, but a fair minimum wage starting at $20 an hour. And that's the other alternative. Either you don't use them or you let them work at a proper wage. Um, but uh, it's essentially slave labor and they deserve uh, compensation for what, what they've been doing. If, yeah. the, if the minimum that a person in prison could be paid was the same as a person outside of prison, that would de-incentivize the economic reasons yeah. for wanting to put people in prison. 
But for as long as we have that wage floor lower than it is outside of prison, even if it's cheaper, it's still incentivizing locking people in cages for their labor. And I also kind of want to raise up, there's this idea that like you, you can volunteer to do work when you're in prison, you know, and that's often how it's framed, you know, well, it sure. is voluntary. People don't have to do this. They can just stay in a cage all day. And it's like, yeah. well, if you're locked in a prison all day, of course, you're going to want to do something that feels meaningful, especially if it lets you get outside and interact with other people, you know. Uh, first, you're going to want to do that versus sitting in a cell, you know, or sitting inside a concrete facility. Um, but I, I would hesitate to ever refer to that as voluntary because you've already restricted the the freedom someone has to be so narrow that the options they're then given don't really represent like a human's will. You know? mm -hmm. Yeah, um, of the uh, of these six states that pay their prisoners zero. Those are for regular prison jobs. But then you also have your uh, jobs in state owned businesses. And four of those six states actually do pay uh, their prisoners if they're working in those state owned businesses. The two states that don't pay any of their uh, prisoners anything no matter what they're doing is Arkansas and Georgia in one other aspect of campaigning that I, I, I know I experienced and I, I'm sure Devin you've experienced this is that it's extremely hard to find any kind of venue where you have enough time to really lay out what you stand for and make an argument for it and you're also in this situation, I think, which explains the fact that there's this stump speech that gets repeated ad nauseum. Um, and it's because you're not gonna have a chance to speak to the same group of people more than once, the way things are organized. And you're only given a small amount of time. And it's a ridiculous amount of time um, at, uh, at events, for example, of local county Democratic Party meetings. I mean, often they'll only give you five minutes um, to say anything. Uh, Indivisible will give you five minutes. Um, young Democrats will, it depends. Sometimes I'll give you a tiny amount of time, but you know, they're just not taking seriously the idea that uh, what a party stands for is something that should be debated and discussed. And uh, it's, the whole process is organized in a way where if you don't have money, you hardly get out in any contact with voters and the opportunities you have give you very little time to say anything to, to a single voter. And then if you have a ton of money, what do you do? You basically have sound bites that you plaster on TV. So there's no proper political debate, really. No proper political discussion. And you know, this week there are these debates taking place um, in, the, in the coming weeks that are organized by the press club in Atlanta. And I know you're gonna be in invited right you haven't done it yet have you or or did you participate in that debate which one of the Atlanta press doing? club is having they do it for all the congressional yeah. candidates oh you've had it okay mm -hmm. so it's mm -hmm. you know it's a very short exercise of a half an hour at most mm -hmm. and there's really no time to do much of anything it's a real really sad excuse for proper treatment or coverage mm -hmm. of the race and what candidates stand for and of course it's not even broadcast directly it yeah. just goes to the online, the online website of uh, public TV, which probably hardly any of the voters look at. Here's my perception of um, of that. So, the uh, the APC debate. Uh, so you'll have a candidate like my opponent, Andrew Clyde, and there's really there's no real substance to his answers and so his answers are normally i love trump i love the second amendment no abortions um i'll, I'll do everything that i can for businesses that's pretty much his four-tier platform yeah. while i am doing my best to tackle actual issues that matter to people you know uh, the economy, which has nothing to do for us regular people, has nothing to do with the stock market. Health insurance, uh, you know, all of those things that are very, uh, 
detailed and complicated issues that anyone worth their salt who actually wants to speak to the issue needs more than 60 seconds to speak to that issue. And so in my debate, uh, I was consistently running out of time because as you can see, my, my words are, are calculated and I'm not a politician. I'm not polished. I'm not, uh, I'm not going to simply say what you want to hear. I'm going to tell you the truth. And so the difference between my answers, between my two and a half, three minute answers, if I'm allowed that time, are cut a third of the way short while it makes, it really makes, in my opinion, it makes my opponent look better than he really is because he seems concise, he seems to the point, but if you really dig into the, the answer, his answer to the question, there is no substance. The only thing he ever says is that he loves Trump and he wants to take care of his own business. That's it. Yeah, and I wonder how much, we've talked about so many different things that overlap, but one common theme for for so many of the systems in our country that go wrong is money, right? Money incentive for all these things. And it's interesting that that for media coverage, for to, in order to have anybody actually host or like have uh, a platform where people will pay attention, it's somebody who has money. And since they don't necessarily make money off of of having robust political debate or discussion, uh, they, it doesn't seem like there's anybody who who broadcasts that kind of thing. And that's why it seems to me like part of why our, uh, among many reasons, uh, but why our political debates are so sad and sort of like these truncated, uh, you know, barely debates uh, at all. Um. I mean, other nations do it differently. You know, they have publicly subsidized elections and they, they ensure, first of all, they keep the campaigns much shorter than ours are. They don't let them go on for more than a year, as uh, I think happens in many, many campaigns. That was even true for some of the city council campaigns, I remember, where some candidates really started out extremely early on the campaign trail. They keep it short, but they keep it subsidized in a way that you get saturated exposure on the media. And I think you can have meaningful debates if you, if you ensure that all the candidates have to have appearances and have a chance to present things meaningfully and have access to it, right? We can have it all access to many things online provided we have broadband for everyone, wipe out poverty and so people can have access to the machines and equipment they need. And um, we, we could change things. So the voters were properly informed. Every candidate could make their case to the public and have a real chance instead of having very little chance because from the outset, you don't have the money that is needed to get your sound bites out to everyone or get your existence out to everyone. Mm -hmm. And then in, um, in this district, in the ninth district, uh, for, uh, the, for let's say, let's take radio, for a radio ad in the, Spartanburg, uh, three other cities in, in South Carolina, um, that market is $150 a spot. And that, that's manageable comparatively. It's manageable, but that only reaches 14% of my constituents. Then the other 86% is in the Atlanta market. Those spots, are $500 a spot. Unless you do have unlimited amounts of money pouring in. And I heard many, many, many commercials or many ads from Andrew Clyde during the primary. Unless you have money pouring in or you have, uh, or you're independently wealthy, which uh, uh, Andrew Clyde has both, uh, you can't, afford those things. And if you can't afford them, I bet you can't afford anything else. 
so the, a lot of this now is pointing to, I guess, one other thing I feel compelled to bring up before this whole thing is over, um, which is this idea, a lot of folks probably heard about reversing citizens or overturning Citizens United. Um, but really clarifying that corporations are not people and that money is not free speech or money is not speech. Um, there's a really great organization I like called Move to Amend that champions this cause. Um, on the local level, we can't do much more than pass a resolution in support of that, although I would love to see that happen here in Athens and I hope to advocate for that successfully in the coming uh, years um, or months even. <laughs> but uh, on the federal level, you know, you all are running for uh, the positions that, you know, that decision would actually be made. And I think there's a lot of value in that, not only for how it would affect our elections, but the way that we think of wealth as power generally in our society you know because even if we find ways to sort of chip away at how people can get ballot access or you know, enfranchisement of voters you know how elections are funded we still have this issue of a, a massive concentration of wealth on a, on, a, on a amount of folks and there's something highly problematic about that as a society and it's uh it's, it's really gone to major extremes, you know, globally, but especially here in the United States in the past decade or so. Um, and so finding a way to reverse that trend, uh, ideally as swiftly as possible, I think is really important. And that's where I think economic policy is so integral to anything we can, we can talk about, whether it's election reform or healthcare or housing, you know, all these things kind of go back to the economic uh, reforms that we really need to see happen. Um, some of my favorites being the Green New Deal and a, a federal jobs guarantee, kind of something that Richard would say. I was just gonna say that I think the real problem is not a question of whether we allow corporations to be treated as people. We don't want people to be able to use their wealth to gain disproportionate political influence. And that's the problem. Um, you know, you can speak freely, but that's different from having the money to allow your political speech to drown out everyone else. I mean, we sort of saw it in a kind of ridiculous display when Bloomberg decided to get into the campaign. And I remember, you know, as I was going around on my campaign before the pandemic hit, you know, I'd be running in to people all over the place who were being funded by Bloomberg. And his ads were, you know, filling up the pages of every tiny little regional newspaper. It was kind of ridiculous how much more money he had thrown into this than, than anyone else. And uh, of course he, he couldn't end up buying the election, but nonetheless, he obviously got out there in a way that he couldn't have, if he, if he didn't have the money to throw around. And that, that we have to stop. And I believe that, uh, I believe that that's not going to happen anytime soon. And what it's going to take is people like us, activists, volunteers, those who are getting involved to continue to push, 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 and fight, 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 to get the people in the offices where we can actually make that change. Because as long as the wealthy are in those positions, they're not gonna change it. They are not going to act um, against their own interests, even if it means making this country better. Yeah, and you know, to me, I, I really think of this as I'll kind of double down on saying that, you know, wealth is power. And if we start talking about putting people's power in check, I think it's, it really draws into question, like, well, how much wealth is too much? You know, what, I think we, I think it's, the imperative is kind of on us as folks who have an elevated platform to uh, facilitate discussions around the immorality of having wealth in the first place. Uh, you know, it's my view that like, it's unethical to be, a billionaire um, there and it's not just if you're a billionaire who decides to run for office and makes an attempt to buy an election and like oh thank god you know Bloomberg didn't get there but he still owns all that land he still has all that power over people's livelihood over people's housing you know over you know the people who own uh and, and manage massive quantities of wealth and property have disproportionate influence on society regardless of how directly involved they are in our electoral process. And so I think it's really important to recognize that that itself is a problem. And there's a way that that also goes all the way back to the founding of this nation, you know, and the idea of driving people off, the indigenous people that were wiped off this planet on this idea that uh, 
you know, and driven, th those who survive driven to these tiny, you know, pockets of land around the country uh, is, is kind of built on this idea that like people are entitled to just own a whole bunch of land. Um, and, and, you know, represented in our political process from the beginning, you know, landowners are the ones who get to vote. Um, and, and, you know, to some degree, uh, that's been mitigated to this day. Uh, by some of the reforms we've talked about earlier on enfranchisement, but we're still seeing landowners have a great amount of influence in terms of just people's ability to get to, to exercise their rights in a variety of ways, not just at the ballot box. And of course, a huge part of the problem is the role of the private media. And you know, we may think in traditional terms, in terms of newspapers, newspaper chains radio stations and, and chains of radio stations and TV. And as, as we all know, you know they're, they're growing monopolies in all of these fields, growing concentrations where uh, there are certain private corporations that control vast parts of the media. And then of course, there's the social media, there's Facebook, there's uh, Google and so forth, who are the new gatekeepers. And obviously, you know, we have to deal with the problem of freeing political discourse from their control. And that's, that's something that is also a fundamental part of any meaningful electoral reform. Yeah, sorry, I was looking for the uh, uh, actual um, bill that was passed in the 90s that allowed um, our media to essentially be the way that it is now that happened under the Clinton administration. Yeah. Um, but we're also pretty much at our time that we wanted to keep here. And so um, I was thinking maybe we could just do some final thoughts and then have you all, you know, tell people who you are again and where to find you. You want to go uh, around this? We'll, we'll go the opposite way that we went before. We'll go Richard, then Jesse, then Devin. Okay. Uh I'm Richard Dean Winfield, and I'm running for the U.S. Senate in a special election. And the thrust of my campaign, besides concerns about eliminating the obstacles to equal political opportunity, are the way in which we've allowed social uh, obstructions to opportunity to not only rob us of freedom in society and at home, but also prevent us from really participating as equals in, in self-government. So take a look at my campaign website, winfieldforsenate.com. Listen to my, my campaign um, uh, America Unchained podcast, and you might read my latest book, Democracy Unchained, which discusses a lot of the remedies that I think we need to follow. So thank you, and make sure you vote, and let's make sure that our votes count versus any disruptions uh, that uh, Donald Trump has planned after the election. Thank you. Yeah, I just want to extend a big thanks to you, Aaron, and the folks in Athens for everyone for making all these possible, and, you know, organizing them and promoting them and distributing them after, making up some of those gaps we're talking about in the media. Uh, and Richard and Devin, it's been awesome getting to share some time with y'all chatting. So look forward to doing it with y'all in person, hopefully at some point within the next uh, five years. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, I'm, honestly, I'm kind of feeling a bit uh, tired of my stump speech, but I think my parting thought on this is uh, I think it's important to recognize our the humanity in every person and that we need to think critically about the ways that we may be failing to recognize the humanity in every person because of the context we've grown up in and the structures that we're a part of and the ways that we might be um, maybe unconsciously contributing and trying to like build that awareness out. And so I think it's conversations like this that really take and make space to think critically that are important. And I think for folks who are in positions of influence, whether it's during a campaign season where we just, you know, our, our pedestals are elevated a bit for people to listen or you know, if and when we're in elected office, or supervisors and jobs or whatever, um, that it's important to keep thinking big about the transformative stuff down the road. I think it's real easy to get caught up in, well, what can we pass this year? What can we do right now? And those things are important, but I think it, it is really important to evaluate 
uh, big picture and, and, and kind of think about the, the horizon. And so uh, it was really nice to talk with you all about some of that today. Um, but if people do want to get in touch with me, my name is Jesse Houle. You can go to jesseforathens.com to learn more about me and the campaign. And hopefully after that, stay connected for commission activities. You can also email me at jesseforathens at gmail.com. Thanks. Yeah. All right. Well, again, my name is Devin Pandy. I would like to uh, thank uh, uh, Richard and, and Jesse for being on here. Um, and thank you, ma'am, so much uh, for doing these. It's, it's, um, it's always a great conversation. And, and what I would like to say to anyone who is watching is that uh, I hope that you agree with me that just this small panel of three people um, and many others out there who are uh, stepping out of their comfort zone to run. Uh, you have some great choices. You have some great choices this election season. And, uh, and if you don't know us, if you don't know the others, please look us up and uh, compare us. You know, don't, don't take our word for it. You know, research, do your own research. Don't take anyone else's word for it. Do your own research. And, uh, and once you see, uh, the truth for yourself, then come back to us and see who is telling you the truth all along. And uh, what I would also say is that to anyone out there who looks like me, who uh, may have a little uh, more melatonin, uh, melatonin, oh my gosh, <laughs> more melanin in their skin, um, to anyone who has ever been suppressed, uh, women, LGBTQ community, um, lower income community, uh, everyone who has ever been suppressed, just remember, there is always, remember my, 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 um, my thing about leadership, there is always a motivation. And think about what the motivation is. Your vote is suppressed because those who are suppressing it know that when you vote, we win. So the most important thing right now is to vote and you might be wondering is my vote secure if i send in this ballot will it be counted if i go early vote will it count if i go on election day will it count the only thing that you can be sure of is that if you don't vote it won't count so vote please and for those who who have been suppressed just remember look at all of us if we can run you can vote my name is Devin Pandy. You can uh, stay in contact with my campaign by going to my website at devinpandyforcongress.com. Uh, you can send an email to email at devinpandy.com, at devinpandyforcongress.com. And you can also uh, call the campaign. You can give me a call uh, at 706-449-0022. Uh, I believe in being accessible. Um, I believe in having a town halls. Um, I don't know if you remember the last time Doug Collins has had a town hall, but I'll tell you, I can't remember the first time Doug Collins has had a town call, had, has had a, a town hall. So uh, I will be having a, at least, at the very least, um, uh, quarterly town halls. I will also have at least two, if not more, he uh, campaign headquarters throughout the ninth district. I believe in being accessible. I believe in being um, transparent and I believe in being a representative of the voters who voted for me. And you will have no doubt in your mind that that is true because I am not accepting uh, campaign contributions from anyone uh, but you. Uh, so uh, thank you for hiring me on November 3rd and I can't wait to represent you. Awesome. And thank you all so much for being here. Richard and Jesse and Devin. Uh, again, this has been Athens for Everyone. Candidates discuss. This one's a little extra and we're hoping to have um, a few more of these and even more candidate discuss events before the election on November 3rd. So you get to hear from people who are running to represent you. And uh, we'll see you all next time. <laughs>